From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. So far, there hasn't been a dull moment in 2017. Three former lawmakers charged in separate criminal cases. A major settlement in the 38 Studios case is prompting renewed calls for transparency. And President Trump's executive orders have sparked protests here in Rhode Island. All that and the General Assembly hasn't even tackled the car tax, free college tuition, or the rest of the state budget. We break down a tumultuous January and look ahead on what to expect next with our guest, Rhode Island Governor Gina Raimondo. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the program, as always, from WPRI.com, reporter Ted Nisi. Governor, it's really good to have you back. Welcome back to the program. Thank you. Um, I want to start with something that happened just before we walked into this studio. Um, Attorney mm -hmm. General Peter Kilmartin came out with a wild statement. Um, after saying 38, the 38 Studios case was inactive but still open, uh, he now <laughs> considers it closed. And this all has to do with the release of grand jury material, which we're going to talk about. Now, he put the blame on the head of the Rhode Island State Police, Colonel Anna Sumpico. The release says, for the first time, Colonel Sumpico informed me that she considered the investigation closed, that she would commit no further resources to it, and that her decision was final. First, I got to ask you, did you order Colonel Osampico to close the investigation? No, absolutely not. Uh, have you talked to her about the 38 Studios uh, investigation? Not at length, no. You know, I know her staff has talked to my staff. Uh, I think her position, not to speak for her, is that, you know, the grand jury on this closed a year and a half ago. And uh, I think her position is if there was a reason to keep it open, if there was new information, new investigatory material, go ahead and keep it open. But the Attorney General himself last year said it's an inactive investigation, so uh, she feels that it's time to close it. What do you make of all this? I mean, you are at odds with Peter, Kilmart Peter Kilmartin over the release of the grand jury materials. You said at the conclusion of the civil case, which that looks like is happening, you would go and ask for the, to the courts and ask for those to be released. Peter Kilmartin does not want to have that happen. He has said the case is still open but inactive and here we have this uh, late Friday kind of press release. What do you make of all of it? Uh, you know, look, I'm coming down on the side of transparency. I never liked this deal. I was against it from the beginning and, na and as I've said all along, once the civil case was wrapped up and it looks like it's going to be wrapped up next week, let's put everything out there. I do but is he taking a shot at your administration here? He doesn't agree with me, and that's okay. You know, I respect his position. He's coming at this as the attorney general with one particular lens, which is this criminal case. I just have a different view, which is I think the public deserves transparency on this one. I think on this case, the civil case is closed, the criminal case is closed. Let's get everything out there. At the end of the day, the judge will decide. All I'm saying is let's ask the court. You know, he'll have a chance to make his argument to the court. My folks will make our argument to the court. The judge will decide. I just want full, complete transparency as soon as possible so we can finally put this behind us. You said you haven't talked at any length with Colonel Asumpico about this case. What have you, what conversation did you have with it? Uh, really not much. I mean, this is her decision. You know, this is the heart and soul of police work, investigation. So it's not a place that I get um, especially involved in. When they held the news conference, and it was the former colonel at the time, did you feel, okay, that period at the end of the sentence, the case is closed because they announced no charges? To you, is that a closed case? Again, this isn't really my call. Uh, and in some ways, here's my position. I want to go ask a judge, is it okay to release this to the public? There will be plenty of opportunity for the Attorney General to speak out, for the Colonel to speak out, and a judge will decide. I just think in this particular case, which has been hanging around our neck for years, which costs taxpayers millions of dollars, people want to know what's in those documents. What did you learn? What mistakes were made? So let's let it out there. You, one last question. There's some very experienced lawyers, Claire Richards, among others, on your team uh, and your administration have worked for other governors as well. Uh, what have they told you about the likelihood of success? I assume you've asked them to look at the, whether this has been done and whether it could work. Uh, you know, we wouldn't be doing it if we thought we had, if, if we didn't have a good case. Uh, so we feel, again, again, civil case is closed, criminal case is closed. Let's put the information out there. 
The Attorney General will argue, as he has, that he feels if information is brought out in a grand jury, that that ought to be kept secret forever because it deters witnesses. Reasonable position. So we'll let a judge, an experienced judge, look at all the facts and circumstances and make the decision. Let's talk about uh, the president's executive But I've order. heard enough from Rhode Islanders on this case. This isn't just any case. And I've heard enough, and I'm sure you guys have too. People want to get past it, and I don't know if we're going to get past it if we don't let all this out in the open. And that's, there may be nothing there, but all the more reason. Let's let it out there. Sorry. That's okay. Immigration right now, <laughs> as you know, Rhode Island law enforcement does not share immigration status to the feds unless um, there's an outstanding order for deportation. You don't want to call Rhode Island a sanctuary state because you don't want to risk losing federal funding, what, $3 billion? Uh, but others, possibly the White House, may look at the policy alone and say, well, Rhode Island is a sanctuary state. Do you, do you think the policy alone puts the state at risk? that we're not cooperating with the feds on um, supplying immigration information? I don't. I do not. Um, so a few things. We don't really know what a sanctuary state is. This is kind of a brand new term. Uh, the new president hasn't defined that for us. It's, it's, it's left vague. Uh, so we have to wait and see what that means. Having said that, my review of our policies would suggest that we're not a sanctuary state based on what I understand that to be, and uh, I don't think we ought to become one. Uh, and I don't want to do anything that would jeopardize our federal funds. As you say, it's you know billions of dollars for the people of Rhode Island. So you know, right now, if you are arrested for a crime, you'll be fingerprinted. Those fingerprints go automatically to the FBI database, which goes automatically to ICE. And if there's a uh, you know, a deportation order, which is a flag, uh, ICE is notified. Uh, we don't detain anybody. We won't hold anybody overnight unless we have a court order. That's, that's the law. You know, that is the law in Rhode Island. That's the law as set forth by a judge. So our state police follow the law. They keep us safe. We're going to continue doing what we've been doing. And I don't think that does jeopardize our, our federal money. You've uh, been very critical of uh, Donald Trump on the executive order, uh, among other things, since he took office. Uh, Republican Krantz Mayor Alan Fung, who may run against you <coughs> next year again, said in his statement about the ban, it was rolled out far too quickly, but then he took what, what read, some would read as a shot at you. He said, quote, we all know how botched rollouts go in this state and often leads to a lot of anguish and needless suffering. Uh, a fair comparison? Uh, I do not think so, and but I agree. It was a unnecessary political swipe on a very serious topic. What the president has done with the Muslim ban is, in my judgment, a violation to a core American value, which is religious freedom. And that's why I spoke out. You know, I'm not going to speak out every time the president does something I disagree with. I'm not going to go to a rally every weekend necessarily. But this one bothered me because it's un-American to have a re to have religious based discrimination. You know, they the Republicans are saying it's not that. Right. Paul Ryan just yesterday, it's not a Muslim ban. He said I wouldn't support it if it was a Muslim ban, so it's not a Muslim ban. But it is because this doesn't say we're targeting people who we believe to be terrorists. We're targeting people who we believe, you know, to be a threat to America. We're targeting people because they're Muslim and they're in my majority Muslim countries. Uh, the other night I had dinner with a family of Syrian refugees. These are folks who are in Rhode Island, and I'm so happy they're here. They're, you know, from Syria, they were refugees. These people um, ought to be able to come to America, and they shouldn't be discriminated against just because of their religion. I mean, these are little kids, you know, these, these are little kids. They were afraid. They showed me their house, it was bombed. That is American, you know, to open our doors and let them in. They're not terrorists, and they shouldn't be we shouldn't withhold, you know, safety for them simply because they were born Muslim. And so for me, religious-based discrimination is a slippery slope. I had to speak out against it. Um, and that's going to be my guide. Every time the president does something that I think makes Rhode Islanders less free, less safe, less able to make a living, I'm going to stick up for Rhode Island. Whatever a sanctuary state is, you want to avoid that label. <clears throat> 
uh, because you don't want to put federal funds at risk. Mayor Providence has now said Providence is a sanctuary city. If Trump follows through on his threat and it withstands legal challenges, I suppose, which there probably would be, right. do you think that was risky for him considering the financial state of the city? Should he have done that? Uh, I'm not going to say whether he should or shouldn't. You know, he has to run his city and he's hearing from his constituents every day, you know, many of whom are very afraid about the new president. But if the funds are withheld, it could be your but headache. It, uh, we will not have the money to, the state will not have the money to, you know, backfill the loss of the federal government. So was it risky? Yes, I think. Um, was it the wrong thing to do? I don't know. You know, that's his decision. He's the mayor. He's doing what he thinks is right. Uh, will the president be able to withhold funds? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think the president has that power. I don't think it's constitutional. So, you know, there's a lot of unknowns on this one. There's uh, been a lot of talk about how Rhode Island won't have a lot of connections to the Trump White House between being so Democratic, including our governor being Democratic. Donald Trump did tap former Goldman Sachs exec Gary Cohn as one of his top economic advisors. He was actually here Who you met, less right. than a year ago. I met him at uh, your event when he uh, announced the Goldman Sachs initiative. His wife is on the RISD board. Have you spoken to him at all uh, since he took the job with the White House? I have. I have. I've called him. I called to congratulate him. Uh, I plan to get together with him in February when I'm visiting the White House. And what I said to him is what I have said to you know, everyone that I know, part of the administration, which is, we want to work with you. Uh, I mean, look, we're, we're rooting for their success. We want them to be successful in so far as... A lot of Democrats uh, won't like hearing that. They'll say they don't want Donald Trump to succeed. Well, we don't want... Look, I oppose him on pretty much everything. Like, everything he's done so far, I disagree with. Uh, having said that, we want America to be successful. And so I'm going to, I need to work with that administration. You know, Elaine Chao, I've reached out to her. The to, transportation. Excuse me, the new transportation secretary. We just passed Roadworks. We are in a great position, I believe, uh, to get federal transportation money. I'm going to call her. I'm going to work with her. Gary Cohn, I'm going to stay in touch with him. Just because that's my job. You know, I have a job to do. I can't let Rhode Island be left behind be penalized, not get the federal money um, that we deserve. But when they do, when the president does things like a Muslim ban or targeting undocumented immigrants, I'm going to speak out too. You know, we have to go to a break, but um, you bring up something interesting. You have roadworks there. It, it, are you worried that the president might be vindictive with the stands that you're taking and, you know, mm -hmm. maybe order his transportation secretary to shut that down? Is there, is, you know, you, yeah, is that I on your don't, mind? I don't think he will do that. He is now the President of the United States. I have to believe he's above that. Um, we saw it with Governor Christie in New Jersey. It typically doesn't work out well for politicians when they try to exact revenge on political enemies through their official channels. So, I don't think so. For bridges, so. actually. <laughs> For bridges, actually. Right. So I don't, uh, and I'm going to do whatever I can to work with the new administration, but I am going to speak out. I am not going to be silent if I think what they're doing hurts Rhode Islanders. Our guest this week is Governor Gina Raimondo. When we come back, the car tax and her free college tuition plan. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my left, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Our guest this week is Governor Gina Raimondo. Governor, I want to talk about your free uh, college tuition plan, two years free college tuition. Roger Williams University President Donald Farish wants to see you offer a tuition waiver for Rhode Island students so they can get free college tuition or reduced at, at the private schools as well, not just the public schools like URI and RIC and CCRI. What do you say to that? Uh, I'm not sure I'd get the money. <laughs> Why would it be any different? So, what he's saying is, my understanding is a waiver. It wouldn't, it, 30 million be 30 million. So if you get $8,000 for URI, you can apply that to Roger Williams University. So that like sounds. A voucher. A voucher. A that voucher. sounds cost, that's how I read his proposal. That's interesting. Well, a uh, couple things, various things. First of all, um, like you, you know, you hear from people every day, I desperately want my kids to go to college. I'm very anxious how we're going to pay for it. So I you know, think that this is going to be hugely beneficial to Rhode Island. The program we're putting in place, in addition to 
so helping to solve for college affordability supports our public institutions. You know, supports it. You know, URI, CCRI, and RIC. Their funding has been cut and cut and cut over the years. So this is also supportive of our public institutions. Also, with that kind of a system that you say, the w students would get less money. In other words, we're not saying every high school graduate now can have this program. It's just the high school graduates that go to RIC, CCRI, and URI. So if you're going to divide $30 million by every high school graduate, it would be very diluted benefit, whereas what we're saying is free college. It's simple. You do your part. You work like crazy to get through high school. If you go to URI and RIC, you put your skin in the game and do the first two years, and we'll get you through. So it's, it's a free college effort, which will have a much bigger impact to our economy than a very small voucher. Uh, yeah, and that brings up my uh, second question. You've pegged the cost after four years. You know, it would grow to be $30 million. That would be the top, uh, top amount. But what if, like, Prepare RI, it's more popular than you thought? Is that a ceiling, <laughs> or are you willing to go up? On the $30 million? Yeah. Well, look, our promise, if, if the legislature goes with me on this, is everyone who wants to go to CCRI, URI from RIC, who's a high school graduate from Rhode Island, would get to go. So if this is hugely popular, it could cost more than $30 million a year. It's possible. However, we've already built in, I think, a 25% increase. So there's one other state which does something similar, which is Tennessee. Tennessee uh, has a program where it's free community college for everybody. By the way, that was brought about by a Republican governor and a Republican legislature and it was passed, it's very successful. They have been doing it for a few years and they have found that there's about a 20% increase in students that will go. So we have put in, I think, a 25% increase, uh, which I think is probably what we'll see. And if we see more than that, then yes, it will cost more money. Yes. Go ahead. I've been covering the state budget a number of years now and I was struck that your budget proposal takes the total spending well past nine billion dollars. I remember when it was below I seven uh, when I was first a reporter in Rhode Island. It's gone up about 10 percent during your first three budgets. National economy is only growing two percent-ish yeah. a year. Donald Trump hopes that rises but it hasn't yet. How is that sustainable to have state spending grow that fast in an economy that's not growing really very fast at all? It's a very good question um, and also we haven't grown our, our people. You know, at the whole the whole time we've been uh, that you're talking about, we've actually shrunk the size of government in terms of our uh, number of employees, and in, and in many places we've shrunk uh, what we offer. The what drives the numbers are education. So after the state put in place the education funding formula to K through 12, it's really been on the incline. Uh, Health care. That's the big nut. You Medicaid. Know, Medicaid. Medicaid is over a, one, over a third of the budget and increasing. Now, since I've been governor, we've substantially reduced what we thought it would be, um, but health care costs are still a big driver uh, in the budget. So that's why we have to continue to cut wherever we can, but it's also why I always say economic growth is the only answer. You know, you can only cut so much. As I say, we continue to cut the number of people who work for the government. We need growth, which is why I put free college on the table. That's a tiny investment, less than 1% of that $9 billion budget. To be the first state in the country to offer free college, every business in America will want to be here. Uh, if they know we have the best, most educated workforce in America. We're it's a small growth. state. I don't know if we can hold every yeah, business okay, in America. Yeah. But you see my point. Yeah, like yeah. The point of it is, it's economic growth, mm -hmm. growth, jobs. 70% of good jobs require some degree past high school. 40% of Rhode Islanders have some degree past high school. You know, last year, I was happy. We brought in General Electric, Johnson & Johnson, Virgin Pulse. I want Rhode Islanders to get those jobs. Those are great jobs. Rhode Islanders deserve those jobs. So let's get them to CCRI, get a degree, and go get a great job. One other budget question uh, quickly. In December, state revenue came in below expectations, uh, more than 5% lower than uh, the budget forecasters. Are you concerned about that? Are you seeing any turn in the economy? Is it going the wrong way? Uh, not partic No, I'm not um, seeing a turn. Am I concerned about that? Of course. You know, we've had a, a good run of things. You know, our economic development efforts are beginning to pay off. 
the unemployment rate is down, revenues are good. However, uh, you always have to plan that it might not always be this rosy. And so that's another reason this year in the budget I put forth more cuts to health care, reducing the cost of health care, more cuts to general government. We have to be responsible. I have a budget question, actually. Um, and be honest about this one. If Speaker I'm always honest <laughs> when I talk to you. <laughs> I, but if Speaker Mattiello had not made the car tax pledge on the campaign trail, would it have been part of your budget proposal? Uh, I think so, yes. I, I was more really? inclined. Well, here's what I need to say. He's clearly stepped out on it, and I give him a lot of credit for it because it's a big problem in Rhode Island, and I want to work with him on it. Having said that, I mean, you remember when I campaigned, I did a, an event with Mayor Lorza on the car tax. I have pledged many times it's something that I wanted to deal with as governor. My first two years, it wouldn't have been possible because the deficits were so big. So this is really the first year we could have even thought about it. Um, but look, the fact that he's out in front on it, of course, makes me m even more eager to work on it because when the legislature wants to work with me on something, I think we'll get it done. After you uh, released your budget proposal, uh, the speaker doubled down on his car tax plan, uh, pledging to eliminate it, eliminate it in five years and unlike your proposal, have it take, it, uh, take effect this year. Uh, will you sign the budget if all of that is in it? his version of the car tax plan? You know, at this point I'm waiting to see uh, his plan. I think we're all waiting to see what his plan is and I'm eager to do that. I'll sign anything that I think is responsible and sustainable. At this point I haven't seen a plan that would get me comfortable that the state could find $215 million a year to reimburse cities and towns. I just, I don't know where it's going to come from. but. Look at I'm wide open to alternatives. As I said the night I put my car tax cut in, uh, I want to compromise. The car tax is a, is a terrible tax. People hate it. It's unfair. The way we value it is unfair. It puts a burden on people who can least afford it. So we got to fix it. Whether it's my precise idea or somebody else's, that's not what's important. We have to find relief, but we have to find relief in a way that's sustainable because we tried this before in Rhode Island and it got too expensive. You know, they've tried it in Virginia, it got too expensive. And I don't want to give people a promise today and then two or three years from now say, oops, we can't afford it, we have to tax you again. It was almost comical if it weren't so sad that in the first four weeks of the year, three of those four weeks had an ex-lawmaker, uh, or maybe two in one week, whatever it was, get uh, criminally prosecuted. It's not uh, funny. Crime Town, one of the top yeah. podcasts in the country, bring up every sort of negative thing about corruption and crime and all that stuff in Rhode Island. I mean, does that, does that make it harder when you go to New York or wherever the heck you're talking to these big companies and it's uh, so much of the narrative around Rhode Island still in 2017 is corruption, corruption, corruption. Absolutely. It absolutely makes it harder. And I think it presents an inaccurate portrayal of who we are. You know, Rhode Island's an amazing place to live. It's a great place to raise a family. It's a great place to run a business. And by and large, our government does work. You know, we talked about road work. We are getting big things done on health care and pensions and job creation and economic development. But we just can't seem to get out from under a handful of lawmakers who do the wrong thing and it I'm sick of it I'm disgusted with it I'm done with it I'm frustrated by it and I'm trying to figure out how to change it you know I'm, I'm people ask me all the time well how do we fix it you know you, you need to get high you need to continue to get high quality people to run uh, I'm thinking about what reforms I might propose to the legislature around campaign finance, a line item veto, that might help, because um, we've got to stop it. We have about a minute left in the program. Most people are watching this on a Sunday morning, and the Super Bowl is uh, coming up. First of all, where are you watching the game? At home with my kids and my husband. What kind of sports fan are you? Are you a sort of snack on your nails, nervous watcher? <laughs> no, we're or pretty are you, loud. Are we're you? pretty loud. We're a loud family, yeah. <laughs> so, so look, New England has a pretty decent uh, professional football squad uh, up in Foxborough. They're just up the road. How has their success impacted Rhode Island in terms of the economy? Has it been a, a boost uh, for us? You know, a little bit. I think that uh, it puts us on the map even more. I mean, it is terrific for me when I'm out and about. 
out of the state to say my team is yet again going to the Super Bowl. Oh, I'm my sure they love that. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah. It's a good thing. Obviously, the away, the away team stay in Providence when they play at Foxborough. So a lot of fans too stay in a Providence. A lot of fans it's stay closer. in Providence. In fact, I actually had a call a couple of months ago with the CEO of a company that I was trying to recruit here and he said seconds. he was uh, coming to the Patriots game and I said we're going to stay in Providence and he said why would I do that I said because it's closer to Foxborough than Boston there you go he stayed I told him where to go to dinner he fell in love no. it was Jeff go. Immelt now you're G right, right? Yeah. <laughs> anyway go Pats Governor Gene Raimondo thank you very much for joining us on the program if you missed it it's online WPRI.com don't forget about our podcast on iTunes for Ted Nisi and Tim White we'll see you next week on Newsmakers